Hi students, today we are going to uh, learn about a new topic that is a power of the disproportion and contracted pelvis. So I know that you all have you know, heard about this term, the power of the disproportion and contracted pelvis, CPD and contracted pelvis. So we are going to deal about these two topics in the today. In this uh, today, and before that, we have to review some important points of the female pelvis. So we have studied about the female pelvis, the structure, the uh, function, and the diameter. So just we are reviewing the outline of the female pelvis at the initial uh, slides, and then we will be moving forward to this topic. So first we know that there are different types of varieties of pelvis. So the one is gynecoid, the another that is known as female pelvis, and the another one is android pelvis, that is the known as the male pelvis and another two varieties are there that is anthropoid and platypeloid. This gynecoid is known as female pelvis whereas the android is known as the male pelvis and there are two other that is anthropoid and platypeloid. Now when we are considering about the female pelvis we know there are different parts even you have demonstrated uh, the parts of the female pelvis diameter so you are well aware about this but just we are reviewing that so this uh, female pelvis is composed of or it is made up of made up of two innominate bones one sacrum and pocket so this innominate bones consist of ilium ischium this is the ischium part and this is the pubic bone this three will consist of innominate bones and that is two pair one uh, that is uh, the right side and left side then sacrum and pockets and the pelvis is divided into the pelvis uh, as you know there is true pelvis and false pelvis uh, okay we will move on forward okay now in the true uh, you know the false pelvis it is above the pelvic brim here you can see this is the brim and above the part Whichever the part comes above this pelvic brim, it is that is false pelvis, and another the parts which include the brim cavity and outlet that is known as the true pelvis. Here, this is the brim, this is the outline, this is the brim, otherwise known as the inlet, and here the maximum diameter, the biggest diameter, is transverse diameter. Okay, that extends from uh, the two farthest point from the iliopectineal line okay now next is the cavity cavity is this with other space in between the brim and outlet so this uh, is round in shape so whichever the diameter andro posterior oblique and transverse we are considering it as 12 centimeter okay then the outlet the outlet this is the outlet so it sacrococcygeal joint to the issue to issue to the issue spine and the power of clitoris and hypophysis this all are the boundaries for the outlet and the biggest diameter the maximum diameter in the pelvic outlet is andro posterior diameter that extends from the sacrococcygeal joint to the lower border of the symphysis fibris and it is about 13 centimeter during the labor process as the pockets will deflect backward this diameter will be increased so this is about the true pelvis okay and in the diameters, we are mainly focusing on andro posterior, transverse, and oblique diameters. Now we are moving on to the main topic that is CPD or cephalopelvic disproportion. The name itself indicates that cephalo. Cephalo means it is something related to the fetal head. The pelvis is, you know, the maternal pelvis. So cephalo pelvic disproportion there is some disproportion between these two things the head of the fetus as well as the maternal pelvis the disparity between the head of the baby and the mother's pelvis that is cephalo pelvic disproportion so we will see the definition cpd is the disparity in relation between the head of the baby and the mother's baby here you can see in this picture in one case the baby head may be large to fit through the mother's pelvis so that is the diameter of the fetal head as well as the mother's pelvis are not matching or it is not uh, it, it doesn't proportionate to each other okay so that will lead to cephalo pelvic disproportion now the incidence according to the american college of nursing advice among 250 pregnancies 20 cases may be may be of cpd cephalo pelvic disproportion 
and one study has uh, shown that if the patient, if the mother she had uh, CPD during uh, CPD in her first pregnancy and uh, somehow normal delivery has happened then in the subsequent pregnancy 65 percentage of women will go to the <coughs> vaginal delivery itself okay next is the disproportion what are the factors for the disproportion mainly there are two that is here the average size baby with a small pelvis here the baby is of normal size but the pelvis is small so that it won't be able to accommodate the baby so that it will it has to pass through the birth canal so birth canal will be small the pelvis will be small here but the baby is of the normal size that is one factor or the baby may be big with normal size pelvis so that two factors and in some cases they, there can be both the factors like the baby is big as well as the pelvis is small. These are the factors that can lead to the disproportion. Next we are moving on towards the classification. So mainly there are the classification this CPD is available with disproportion can occur in this part that is pelvic brim, mid pelvis and outlet. So in the brim or inlet contraction here the transverse diameter that is um, that will be less than 12 centimeter but normal it should be 13 but instead of 13 if it is coming below 12 centimeter and or the obstetrical conjugate is 10 centimeter normal it is 10 centimeter if it is less than 10 centimeter and if the diagonal conjugate is less than 11 centimeter normally it should be 12 if in this case any one of this is happening that can lead to the pelvic disproportion if the baby's head is average okay so here you know the trans in the pelvic brim the transverse diameter as we earlier slide we said that the transverse diameter is the um, we said it is the maximum diameter in the pelvic brim it extends from the far to farthest point of the iliopectineal line so that should be 13 but instead of that if it is coming 12 an obstetrical conjugate that extends from the sacral promontory to the midpoint of the symphysis pubis. Uh, it should be 10, but if it is less than 10, then the diagonal conjugate it is from the um, sacral promontory to the lower border of the symphysis pubis. It should be 12, but if it is coming less than 11, then the, uh, this can be lead to some higher pelvic disproportion. Then mid pelvis contraction here. The interitial, interitial spinous diameter, that is the diameter between the tertial spine and the posterior sagittal diameter. Posterior sagittal diameter is, uh, is from the uh, lower border of the symphysis pubis, uh, um, yeah, lower border of the symphysis pubis to the mid, uh, midpoint of the sacrum or S4 or S5. Okay, that is uh, intra, intra uh, sorry, posterior sagittal diameters. So it should be. Uh, the interitial spinal should be 10 cm and sagittal diameter should be 5. But the combination that is 10, 10 to 5, that it should be 15 cm. But in case if the diameter, interitial spinal diameter is um, less, less than 10 and the posterior sagittal diameter is less than 5, that is the total if it is coming 13 cm or less, then that can lead to mid pelvis contraction. Okay. Then outlet contraction here, the shell, the distance between the two shell tuberosity. You know the shell tuberosity, the biggest projection at the shell. So here the interitial tuberous diameter, if the diameter is eight centimeter or less, then we can say it as it is outlet contraction. So these are the three classification. Now the causes for the cephalopelvic disproportion. First one is nutritional deficiency. Any sort of nutrition deficiency, for example, uh, vitamin D deficiency, that can lead to softening of pelvic bones. So the pelvic bones may not be in normal diameter. Okay. The disease or injury to any pelvic bone, 
the developmental defects, large size baby, abdominal fetal position and problem with genital tract. These are the main causes. And again, the causes can be divided into absolute causes and relative causes. In absolute causes, it is mainly focusing on the permanent, some mechanical obstructions and fetal causes. So in mechanical obstruction means it comes under, that is contracted pelvis that we are going to deal with the next, uh, in, in this class itself, and then some tumors. Then temporary fetal cause means some abnormal that the baby's head is big, hydrocephalus and large baby. Then relative causes. Relative causes means it is malpresentation, pro presentation, face presentation, occipital posterior position. So all this can lead to relative causes that can lead to CPAD. Now now we are going to deal about the another topic that that is contracted pelvis okay so here in the contracted pelvis the pelvis is contracted the diameters are contracted so we will go in detail about this topic so there are two definitions anatomical definition as well as obstetrical de definition in this anatomical definition we read it is a pelvis in which one or more of its diameters is reduced below the normal by one or more centimeters what it is it is a pelvis in which any any of the diameters one or more of the diameters is reduced below the normal we know the normal diameters of pelvic rim cavity and outlet but any one of the diameters or more than one diameter if it is below the normal or uh, by one or more centimeter then it is known as anatomical contracted pelvis Okay, so the diameters will be reduced by one centimeter or more than one centimeter. Then it is known as anatomical definition of contracted pelvis. Then obstetrical, uh, in, on the basis of obstetrical aspect, it is a pelvis in which one more, one or more of its diameters is reduced so that it interferes with the normal mechanism of labor. Here also the, the same aspect that the diameters of the pelvis will be reduced but how it interfere it will interfere with the normal mechanism of the labor because the diameters are small considerably small so it is difficult for the progress of labor so it will be interfering with the normal mechanism of labor that is obstetrical definition for the contracted pelvis so what is contracted pelvis any one or more than one diameters of the pelvis will be reduced by one or more centimeter okay that is contracted pelvis Next are the causes. The first, nutrition and environmental defects, then diseases or injuries affecting the bones of the pelvis, diseases or injuries affecting the bones of the spine, okay, the disease or injuries affecting the bones of the spine and the one, then developmental defects. These are the main causes. So here in nutritional uh, and environmental defects, there are two, that is minor, some not major variation minor variation so it is very common but the major variation can occur in this two cases that is rachitic and osteomalacic pelvis this we will discuss in later slides okay then diseases or injuries affect the bones of the pelvis the pelvis may be not normal due to any associated diseases or maybe due to any injuries like to arthritis or fracture or tumors then the disease or injuries that affect the bones of the spine yeah, due to the kyphosis, scoliosis or some coccygeal deformity and poliomyelitis or hip joint disease. Okay. Now the developmental defects means during the developmental period due to some defects the pelvis has deformed that is Nagel's pelvis, osteomalacic pelvis, robot pelvis and rachitic flat pelvis. All this will be dealing in the next slides. Okay. So this is the fracture, it may happen due to some fall or injury, then spinal deformities that is low doses, kyphosis, scoliosis, then Nagel's pelvis. Nagel's pelvis, we know for a normal pelvis, you know that uh, and, uh, and the both side of the sacral promontory, there are two wing-like structure that is sacral ala. Okay. So here in this case, in Nagel's pelvis, any one of the sacral ala will be missing. Okay, so absence of one sacral ala that is known as nagel pelvis. And because of the absence of that sacral ala, what happens? The ilium will be directly joined towards the sacrum. So the uh, you can see in the picture itself that the um, uh, pelvis is deformed. 
Okay. Next is Robert's pelvis. In Robert pelvis, as we said in Nicholas pelvis, any one of the sacral ala will be missing. But in Robert's pelvis, both the sacral ala will be missing. So you can imagine both the sacral ala is not there. So then how the pelvis will be. Okay. Now next is rachitic and ostromalacic pelvis. Here what happens? Uh, due to the um, deficiency of vitamin D, rickets, you know, the disease condition rickets. So if during the developmental period or during the childhood, if the baby had or if the woman during her childhood period, if she had this condition rickets, that will lead to the softening of pelvic bones and due to that the pelvis will be deformed. Okay, that is rachitic and osteomalacic pelvis. It happens due to the deficiency of vitamin D that is rickets. Okay, so these are the causes. Now we are moving, moving on towards the diagnosis. This diagnosis is for both uh, cephalopelvic disproportion and contracted pelvis. So here in the diagnosis aspect, first we have to collect the history. So we will be collecting in detail history regarding childhood rickets, any falls or injuries or pre, uh, uh, previous de delivery. We will, if there is any bad obstetrical history, we will know the previous baby's weight and any complications during the delivery, any perineal tear, any stillage or anything has happened or which mode of the delivery, all we have to collect. Okay. Next is general examination. Generally, we will see the gait of the mother. That is, we have to assess for the scoliosis or kyphosis. So that we will assess and then we will see how the mother gait is, whether she is short stature, whether she is having a short thigh, broad shoulder, whether she has bull neck. So, and whether she is obese or how the hair is distributed, whether she has male distribution of hair. So all this we will be examining. And in the case of uh, body stature, if the woman is having, uh, if her height is less than 150 centimeter or the her height is less than 5 feet, then that the here we can suspect CBD. Okay. Next is abdominal examination. In the abdominal examination, first in primary gravida, there can be pendulous abdomen. Pendulous abdomen means the abdomen will be hanging like this. So due to this shape, what happens? As you know, in primary gravida, the engagement should happen two or three weeks before onset of labor. Okay, normally it happens before the labor pain starts, two to three weeks before itself, the baby will engage, the fetal head will engage. But because of the pendulous abdomen, that will not happen in primary gravida. What happens? The head will be floating like this. Okay, floating inside the abdomen. So that is known, uh, that is one uh, main, uh, main sign that we can see in primary gravida in case of CPD. Okay, then uh, just for our knowledge, if you know this pendulous abdomen it usually it have it comes in multi parous normally because it has lost its laxicity so there are chances of pendulous abdomen and in primary there will be pointed abdomen okay, it's normally it happens these are the two shapes but in but in, if we, if the cpd is there then what happens the primary gravida she will show the sign she will she will have this pendulous abdomen. Usually, it should it should be in multi parous woman. Now, the degrees of contracted pelvis: minor degree, moderate degree, severe degree, and extreme degree. So, the true uh, it depends on we are classifying the contracted pelvis uh, in on the basis of true conjugate. Okay. The minor degree, the true conjugate is 9 to 10 centimeter, minor disproportion. Moderate degree, it is 8 to 9 centimeter, because when moderate disproportion. Severe degree, if it is 6 to 8 centimeter. In extreme, it is less than 6. Here, the vaginal delivery is not at all possible. Okay. Now, another abdominal assessment. Here, that method is known as Pinax method. Here, first the, we will give uh, the dorsal position to the mother with the thigh flex and the thigh separated. Okay, the head uh, you can see in this diagram, in this picture, 
the left hand of the examiner she will grasp the fetal head using her left hand okay she is having the fetal head in, under her she is holding the fetal head whereas the other head for the other hand that is her right hand she has kept just above the symphysis you can see the index finger and the middle finger she has kept over the symphysis pubis okay this is the exact position before that we should keep in mind we should tell the mother to void urine okay her rectum as well as her bladder bladder should be empty otherwise the result may not be correct okay so we will give dorsal position with the thighs flexed and separated and we tell them uh, then uh, proper privacy should be given the left hand of the examiner should hold the fetal head whereas the right hand in the index and the middle finger it should be kept over the symphysis pubis like this okay now what we are supposed to now what the examiner will do she will exert a downward as well as a backward she will push the fetal head downwards and backward okay and during that time using this fingers she will be assessing the overlapping of the parietal bone of the fetal head you know the fetal head is made up of bones and the bones are very soft it has a capability to mold it has a capability to overlap over another bone okay so here we are mainly focusing on the parietal parietal bone if the two uh, if to accommodate to accommodate uh, the uh, to accommodate into the pel pelvis if if the if, <clears throat> if the parietal bone the two parietal bone you know it is situated on the two sides of the fetal head if it is overlapping that we are seeing here okay now we will see again i will just repeat so we are keeping the patient in a dorsal position with the thigh flex and separated head is grasped by the left hand two fingers of the right hand that is index and middle finger are placed above the symphysis pubis why it is kept to note the degree of overlapping when the head is pushed downward and backward okay now this is the position this is the way how the examiner will be holding now so the examiner will be pushing downward and backward so if the head is able to push down in the pelvis without any overlapping of the parietal bone means the fetal head easily it is pushed down to the pelvis in this case it seems that so easily without any overlapping of the parietal bone then we can assume that there is no disproportion okay now if the head can be pushed down a little but there is slightly overlap Okay, uh, of the parietal bone, evidenced by touch on the under surface of the finger, overlapping by zero point five centimeters. So, in the first case, if it is not disproportion, then what happens? The head will be pushed down in the pelvis. We will be able to push down the head into the pelvis without any overlapping of the parietal bone. Okay, on the symphysis pubis. Now, if only a little portion of head is able to push down and, and there is slight overlapping of the parietal bone then it is known as moderate disproportion okay now we we are not at all able to push down the head is not able to push down and the parietal bones is not it is hanging above the symphysis pubis it is not at all depressing down so means our as our fingers is kept so our the thing the fingers will be disturbed by the fetal head we will not able to keep it because the parietal bone because the head is not able to push down that is severe disproportion so understood so uh, this is the one method abdominal method or pinard's method to assess the disproportion okay so here the uh, mother will be in dorsal position thighs flexed when uh, the left hand will be gra will be grasping the fetal head abdominally the fetal head will be held held by the examiner using the left hand right hand index and right finger will be kept over the symphysis pubis then a downward as well as a backward pressure push down the mother will the examiner will be pushing the fetal head downward as well as backward so the overlapping we have to see using this fingers if easily we are able to push the fetal head is able to push down into the under the symphysis pubis into the pelvis 
then no no disproportion but there is slight uh, there only little can be kept under uh, only it can uh, only little portion can be pushed down and there are slight overlapping of the parietal bone then moderate not at all it is not at all pushed down and the fetal head is hanging over the symphysis pubis and these fingers will not be able to be in their position in this case what happened that indicates that severe disproportion okay now sometimes some um, some degree of sometimes the degree of disproportion is difficult to find by this method okay because the head is being flexed in position or the abdomen is thick or the uterus is irritable or the high floating head due to all these factors the the degree of disproportion to assess the degree of proportion that will be difficult now next is abdominal vaginal method that is muller mundro care method this most important thing so initially we studied about the abdominal method that is pinard's method then next is abdominal vaginal method as you know abdominal as well as vaginal both by man okay then that is muller mundro care this method was first introduced by muller muller mundro care method first muller care so this is known as muller mundro care method okay so here this is the most valuable procedure or uh, method to detect the degree of disproportion okay so initially itself the patient should evacuate her bladder and rectum and the patient is placed in dorsal position the left hand pushes the head into the pelvis and the vaginal examination is done by the right hand by this thumb is placed over the symphysis to detect the disproportion you can see in the diagram what is there abdominally one hand is kept you can see the left hand she the left ex, uh, examiner's left hand she has kept over the abdomen and she is holding the baby's head okay whereas the another hand that is the right hand vaginally the two fingers are inserted and the thumb you can see it is placed over the symphysis pubis you understood so you just you can imagine so here the left hand is kept over the abdomen okay which is kept over the abdomen and holding the fetal head like abdominal method itself she is grasping the fetal head whereas as we we said it is abdominal vaginal method okay so here abdominally the left hand has been kept vaginally the right hand but as we do in pervaginal examination the fingers are inserted okay and the thumb is placed over the thumb thumb is placed over the symphysis to detect the this proportion okay. so here you can see the examiner is exert she is pushing down the fetal head and we are assessing the disproportion through the pervaginal fingers now what are the you know, result so if the head can be pushed down up to the level of facial spine and there is no overlapping of the parietal bone over the symphysis pubis what it is we are able to push down the head so one hand is kept pervaginally so pervaginally we will be able to find out the ischial spine okay and through the left hand left hand the fetal head is pushed down so if the fetal head is able to touch fetal head is able to touch coming at the level of ischial spine it means there is no overlap okay there is no overlapping okay and there is no overlapping then it means there is no disproportion okay but as we said earlier the head is pushed down a little but not up to the bulb. here head is pushed down but it is not reaching up to the level of facial spine okay and there is slight overlapping then it is moderate disproportion if the head is not able to push down and even um, so uh, there is as we said the parietal bone is overhanging the symphysis pubis it displaces the thumb then it means severe disproportion Okay, these are the findings for the abdominal vaginal method that is muller mundro care method okay next is the another assessment so we discussed about history collection then abdominal examination 
uh, abdom abdominal examination, abdominal method, Pinard's method, then abdominal vaginal method. Next, another radiological, uh, another examination, pelvimetry. What is pelvimetry? It is assessment of the pelvic diameters and capacity done at 38, 39 weeks. In order to find out the CPD or contracted pelvis, what we are doing at the 38 to 39 weeks, the pelvic diameters are assessed. That is known as the pelvic metry so here this is the instrument which was used it, it is not now now it is not used common this pelvimetry so this is the instrument through that the diameter will be assessed okay so as to assess whether it is contracted pelvis or no now there are imaging pelvimetry or otherwise known as clinical pelvimetry x-ray through x-ray we can find out computer uh, tomography and mri okay and through this, that is through uh, here, we can do the clinical assessment of pelvis. Okay, but generally we, we will insert our hands and we will see the sacrum, how the sacrum is. You can see the fingers where it is directing towards. So here we will see the sacrum, whether the sacrum is smooth or well curved that we can assess in this. And second, the B one, the B picture, here we are checking where you can see where these fingers have gone. This piece is known as a sacrosciatic notch. So we are seeing the notch, how this notch it is, whether it is wide enough. Okay, that. Next is in the C picture, we are assessing pervaginally, we are assessing the what we are assessing. Here you can see where the fingers is indicate has gone. This ischial spine. So we are seeing the ischial spine. How, whether it is smooth or it is difficult to palpate or not, whether it is prominent or this thing and we will see and we will see the capacity whether there is enough space or not. You can see the arrow mark but it is not. Okay. Then another one what we are going to see in the clinical assessment of pelvis is this part. Here you can see what it is. It is iliopectineal line. Okay. This in iliopectineal line we will see whether uh, the normal uh, pelvis or no. Through this, we can find out whether the it is normal, uh, whether it is android or whether it is gynecoid pelvis. To differentiate that, we are seeing this iliopectineal amenum. So, uh, a line. Okay, so the line will be assessed because the, the shape we will identify through the iliopectineal lines. Understood? So, the, another method is clinical assessment of the pelvis is also being done to find out the CPD or contracted pelvis through the first we can see the sacrum whether it is fully well curved or not whether it is smooth so if it is uh, well curved so we there is enough space okay then we will also assess the shell spine okay here the shell spine we will see whether it is smooth okay and whether it is uh, whether it is so much pointed so that it will have to, more space will be occupied then here we will see the uh, here we are seeing the sacrosciatic nose okay then here we are seeing the ischial spine and also the cavity the space then we will be the epithelial line so that is the clinical assessment of the pelvis okay now effect of the contracted pelvis what are the effect of contracted pelvis so in pregnancy due to uh, contracted pelvis there can be incarceration of gravid uterus into flat. What happens if the uterus will be fixed or narrow? It will become narrow because it doesn't have any space. That is incarceration of gravid uterus can happen. Then pendulous abdomen. Okay. Then malpresentation due to contracted pelvis during pregnancy. This problem can arise. Incarceration of gravid uterus, pendulous abdomen and malpresentation. In during labor, Due to the contracted pelvis, there is increased chance for PROM. What is PROM? Premature rupture of membrane. Then cord prolapse, slow cervical dilatation, prolonged and obstructed labor. Okay, so that is the effect of contracted pelvis during labor. Now the effect of contracted pelvis for the mother and fetal injuries. Okay, that is injury. It can lead to injury to the genital tract, female genital tract. Even for the baby, it can lead to asphyxia as well as formation of capital succedy. Okay, these are the effects. Now the management. So the management as we said in the contracted pelvis is divided into uh, mild degree, moderate, severe and extreme conditions. So here 
if it is a mild degree of contraction we can grow for, go for preterm induction we will do the induction of labor but most probably nowadays it is not practiced if multigravida is there if she is multigravida we will collect the proper history and then we can do this preterm in, uh, induction before the 2 to 3 weeks of the edd okay now if it is in if it is major inlet contraction and moderate degree of contraction okay here we can do elective cesarean section because there is no hope as we said in the severe degree or extreme um, disproportion vaginal delivery is not possible we have to go to the normal uh, cesarean section so that will be opted here then trial labor what is trial labor trial labor what we are doing in the trial labor uh, it this can be adopted in case of moderate disproportion okay it should be under proper supervision trial labor is in case of moderate degree of cephalo pelvic disproportion we are conducting the spontaneous labor okay and but one thing is it should be under supervision with facilities of intervention available at hand so what is trial labor if during assessment we found that it is a moderate type of disproportion so directly moving forward in, uh, instead of directly moving on towards the elective cesarean section what we will do we will just uh, see we will try to conduct the normal delivery it is done only in moderate uh, disproportion Okay, what we are trial, we are doing trial, we are checking, we are trying to conduct normal vaginal delivery. But the most important thing is that it should be under proper supervision and with the all the facilities, if any complications or any emergency happen, we should be able to manage it. Okay, so under these circumstances, in moderate disproportion, if we are conducting the spontaneous labor, then it is known as trial labor. That also we can do in case of moderate disproportion, understood? So if it is mild degree of disproportion or contracted pelvis, we can do preterm. Before the term, we can do the induction because before attaining the term, uh, if the baby attains term, the baby size will increase more. Isn't it? As the term reaches, the baby size will increase. So what we are doing, we are conducting, the, we are trying to conduct the normal delivery preterm itself so that the baby size will not interfere with the normal delivery, okay. So this can only be done in mild degree of contraction, okay. And nowadays it is not, uh, favor, it is not practiced a lot, okay. So in multigravida, if she has prior history of CPV, in this uh, pre previous delivery so here we can do prior to the two through weeks of the edd we can and then if it is a major inlet contraction or it is a moderate degree uh, so, uh cephalophilic disproportion or contracted pelvis here in this case we will directly at the term we will go for the elective cesarean section elective cesarean section means planned cesarean section okay and then next is trial labor the trial labor is practiced only in the moderate degree of disproportion under proper supervision with all the facilities available okay and we are we will conduct the spontaneous labor that is trial labor that is about the cpt and contracted pelvis i think you got some idea about the cpd so you should remember cpd cephalo pelvic disproportion here what happens the diameter uh, the uh, one case the baby may be big size or the other case the uh, maternal pelvis diameter is the diameter is be reduced to one centimeter or more than one centimeter any of the diameter if it is reduced one centimeter or more that can lead to cephalopelvis or sorry contracted pelvis okay Okay, so in cephalopelvic disproportion, there will be disparity between the maternal pelvis and the fetal, fetal head. In contracted pelvis, the diameters, only the pelvis is focused here in contracted pelvis. Here, the diameters of the pelvis will be reduced by 1 centimeter or more than 1 centimeter. That is known as contracted pelvis. So here, the diagnosis, history collection should be there. Then abdominal assessment, uh, uh, ab uh, abdominal assessment should be done. Uh, then like uh, we have to see the gait of the mother, we have to see her uh, 
kyphosis, scoliosis, or any spinal deformity, any any abnormal pelvis, and then uh, we have to see we have to see for the uh, abdominal method, Pinard's method. That is abdominal method. We will assess whether there is uh, any disproportion. We will classify the disproportion. If it is no proportion, moderate proportion, and severe proportion. Okay. Then next we are moving. Uh, next we uh, then uh, another method, abdominal vaginal method, that is Muller Munro care method. There also, that also we will be seeing. Okay. Then pelvimetry can be done. Uh, that is radiological assessment also can be done or clinical assessment. We will see. For vaginally we will be uh, assessing for the sacrum, sacrociatic notch, uh, ischial spine, and iliopectinal lung. Is the diagnosis the management? We said that preterm induction can be done, elective cesarean section, and trial. So, I think you got uh, some information about this topic. If you have any queries in this topic, you can uh, you, you feel free to contact me. Okay, you can just maybe have my phone number so you can contact me through that. Okay, thank you.